you for another opportunity to come to your feet and to learn again. We know there is no better place than to sit down at your feet and to hear divine instructions that will guide our lives and that will lead us to speak on the issues of the clergy native dichotomy. I'm trusting the Lord that He will grant me utterance so that I'll be able to say everything that He has planned that I will say today. Now, so we'll start right away. We'll start by trying to explain what that statement means. You know, when I saw it, I said, this is big grammar. So we have to firstly stand, start by breaking it down so that all of us can be on the same page. So let's look at a few definitions. Now, what does the word clergy, what does it mean? Because if we don't understand the topic, then whatever we are saying today, we'll just be saying it. It means a group of ordained, sorry, a group of ordained persons. There is a missing word there. Or a group ordained to perform pastoral or priestly function in a Christian church. So when we say clergy, it's not just one person. It's the body of people that have been ordained, specially ordained, to perform either pastoral function or priestly function in a church. So that's what is called the clergy. Now, let's look at a little bit of the origin of the word. The word clergy originates from the Middle English word clergy, which in turn comes from the old French word clergy, meaning learned men. And then the old French term is derived from the Latin word clericatus and clericus, which means one ordained for religious services. Now, the idea of clergy comes from the Greek, the ancient Greek society where you have the learned people, which are the philosophers, and then the mass of people who are unlearned, that is, you have a group of people, usually a small group of people in the society, who are educated because education was not universally available to people. So it's mainly in those days, the philosophers and their students, and then the families of kings, and then the nobles, that their children can afford the fees to pay to the teachers who would teach them. So those are the privileged few people in the society who are usually educated. Now, the majority of the people in the society in those days were usually not educated. So you have the learned and the masses. That's where the idea of the masses come from. Now, this idea was then brought into the church which was not so in the beginning, we'll see as we proceed on this journey. It was not so at the beginning. So we see that that idea was imported from the world, from the society of that time, into the church. So you now have the clergy who are supposed to be learned and to understand the things of God, whereas the masses of the church, the members of the church, are not supposed to understand they are just supposed to just be following whatever the clergy says. Now, so that's where the idea comes from. Now, let's move forward. You will now see who is a clergyman, a member of the clergy. So when you hear clergyman, clergyman, it means the member of the priest or the pastoral body that pastors the church. Now, the laity, laity refers to all other members of the church who are not part of the clergy, like I have said, this idea was imported from the world of that time, from the Greek society, where you have the learned and then the masses, the masses. And you know, in those days, let me go further to say in those days, the learned, they usually control the masses. That's why the kings are usually educated and their children, so that they can use their knowledge to manipulate the nobility, they use their knowledge to manipulate the masses. So that's what it is meant for. So, so the laity are not supposed to know God. Is 
the clergy who are supposed to know God and to act as the intermediary between God and the laity. That's the idea. Let's move forward. So let's look at the origin of the word laity. The word laity comes from the Greek word lykos, which means of the people, which is derived from lao, laos, which means people. And ideally, what this means is the masses. When you hear the masses today, that's what it means. So, so we now have the clergy and the masses of the church who are the laity. So that's the idea. And then dichotomy refers to a division or a contrast between two things that are represented as being opposed or entirely different. So when you hear the word dichotomy, it means that you put two groups of people together, but they are completely different from each other. So what does it mean to say laity, sorry, clergy, laity dichotomy? It means the distinction between the priest and the non-priest in the church. So there is a clear distinction between those who are called the priest and those who are not the priest in the church. Now, clergy, clergy lady dichotomy implies that the body of Christ is divided into two categories. It was never so in the beginning. It was never. The clergy is considered, again, the other understanding we need to Ah, from the beginning is that the clergy is considered to be superior in all ramification to the laity. Number one, they have superior access to God. Number two, they have superior understanding. Number three, they have superior privileges. Those three things distinct the clergy from the laity. That's the way it is. But let's look at what the Bible says. Was it like this from the beginning? Now, a kingdom of priests is the theme of this program. I know several speakers will have come up to talk about the priesthood of the believer. But I will briefly want to go over it again. It can, it can never be too much. Sometimes when the Lord wants to pass a message across to us, he repeats himself so that we can take it more seriously. So I'm going to go over it again. What, 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 what is the priesthood of the believer? What is priesthood? What does it mean when you say a priest? And what does priesthood, what does it mean? We are going to go over that again. Who is a priest? A priest is a person who mediates between deity and man. That is an intermediary between God and man. Now... It is not only in Christianity that we have priests. Even pagans, they have their priests. Now, the priest offer sacrifices and gifts to appease the deity on behalf of himself, firstly, because he knows that sometimes he can anger the gods. Okay? So he offers sacrifices on his behalf, and he also offers it on the behalf of the people that are worshipping that god. So when we bring it into, into, into Christianity, when you say the clergy, laity, what it means is that the clergy are the priests who go before God to offer supplications and sacrifices on behalf of the members of the church because they have superior access to God, I mean in quotes, than the other members of the church. So... Let's look at it. Now, let's go to Judaism. In the Old Testament, when we look at, before we go to Judaism, in the Old Testament, we see that before the law of Moses was given, there was no way that people, there was no organized religion by which people worship God. Now, there are individuals who were worshiping God on their own, and there were individuals who were worshiping other gods. Now, the society in those days, they used to have their own priest. Okay? They would have a priest of this God, a priest of that God. There were multiple gods. Now, those who want to serve God in those days, now we see example of them. For example, you could see Balaam the prophet. Now, the law of Moses had not been given, but he was a prophet of God. So that means Balaam was serving the true God. Now, 
We also see that God called Abraham, called him out of idolatry, and he began to worship God. Now, you see in those days, apart from the priest in the society that represent the people, in the family setting, the father used to be the priest, is the one who offers sacrifices to God on behalf of his family. And we see another example in Job. You see that Job will offer, in fact, what we call prophylactic sacrifices, anticipatory sacrifices. Even though they have not sinned, he offers sacrifices in case they will sin against God. That was the kind of sacrifices Job used to offer. He was as righteous as that, that even before I sin, let a sacrifice. And that is a typology of Jesus Christ. Before many of us were born, Jesus has paid the sacrifice for our sins. So that's what is a figure of what Jesus did for us. Now, when the law of Moses was given, the law of Moses was exclusive to the children of Israel. And so, who were the priests in the Old Testament? God's original idea was that the whole of Israel would be a kingdom of priests. We see this in Exodus chapter 19 from verse 5 to see. He said, now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So you see that God's original intention was that every Israelite was supposed to be a priest. But the children of Israel told Moses, they said, we don't want all these things. We are afraid of God after they are sinned against God. They said, all this fire, all this thunder on the mountain, we soon kill all of us now. So they consider themselves unworthy of what God wants to do for them. So they said, Moses, only you go and see God. After you have seen him, that is the first idea of clergy lady dichotomy. It was the people who actually said, we don't want to be priests. We don't, because it's the priest who goes before God. They said, we don't want, we don't want to be standing before God. You, Moses, go to God as our priest. Get all the messages and come and tell us. So they created a dichotomy between them and Moses. Not only that, as they continue to mess up in the wilderness, God decided that, okay, let all their, initially the plan was all the firstborn will become priests and represent the families. Okay? God decided to change his mind and said that it's the family of Aaron that will now become the priest. So that's what we have. So we have the Levitical priesthood. Aaron and his family were priests to Israel. There was a high priest, and the first high priest was Aaron. And he was the only one who had the privilege to enter into the holiest of all, the most holy place, where atonement for sins, for the sins of the children of Israel was made. And he had access to that place only once in a year. And then we have the other priests who are his children. And after their generation, all the children of Aaron continue to be priests. And the firstborn continue to be of that lineage. The lineage of Phineas continue to be priests in the land of Israel. So that's what we have. Then we also have the servant or the assistant of the priest who were all the other children of Levi. Aaron was a child of Levi, but all the other children, they became the assistant of the priest. And so they were the ones who were representing the children of Israel in the presence of God. They offered sacrifices unto God on behalf of Israel so that all the sins that were committed were covered. Those sins were not actually remitted. Sins were not remitted in the Old Testament. Sins could only be remitted by a perfect sacrifice. Until Jesus Christ came, no sin was remitted. Now, we won't go into scripture on that because that's not the focus of our discussion. But there are enough scriptural evidence to show that God just forbear or forbore the children of Israel, their sins. He just looked away from those sins. 
because the sacrifice, it was impossible for the sacrifices of bulls and goats to take away sin. Until the perfect offering which was Christ was made, no sin could be remitted. God just looked away. So that was what the clergy of the Old Testament were doing for Israel. Not only that, God also instructed that family, the priests, that they should teach the children of Israel the word of God. All the laws that Moses received from God, they were supposed to break them down into a simpler form so that the children of Israel can understand and can appreciate the word of God. So we have two functions that priests in the Old Testament were supposed to perform. Number one function was to stand before God to make atonement for the children of Israel. And secondly, to take the word of God and use it to teach the children of God, the children of Israel, so that they can follow the way of God, so that they can please God. Those were the functions of the priests of the Old Testament. Now we see that after the children of Israel refused to obey the Lord, and they continued to fumble and to mess up, and to follow after foreign gods, God decided to say, I have had enough of this. There can be no competitor with me. God hates competitors. He stands alone. Nobody can stand beside him. So the children of Israel will not allow God to stand alone. They began to put idols and began to put other gods beside the almighty God. And God said, I am tired. I will put a permanent end to this. And he sent them into exile. And when they came back from exile, it never happened again once. God knows how to deal with us. Sometimes, when we begin to mess up, the Lord will do some things to us because of his love. That's what is called chastisement. The primary way God chastises is to speak his word to us. He gives us cancer through the scriptures. He gives us cancer through the prompting of the Holy Spirit. But if we continue to mess up and we not repent, the Lord will begin to do things to us that will make that disobedience to go to a permanent rest. And so God did it to the children of Israel. And they never follow idol again after they came back. But we discover that in a bid to continue to follow God, different groups began to come up. And the priesthood became corrupted again by politics. And the priest who were supposed to be the servants of the Lord, giving the word of God to the children of Israel, began to follow money. And they became, the priests were actually the ones who became the Sadducees. It's the family of the priests that became the Sadducees at the time of Jesus Christ. And what was their primary belief? The Sadducees, they jettisoned all other scriptures except the law of Moses. They said all the other scriptures of the Old Testament were not inspired by God. And secondly, they also decided to say that there is no resurrection of the dead. And that's why they came to Jesus asking that this man married a wife, he died. The brother married the wife, he died. <laughs> because they said there is no resurrection. Imagine the priest who was supposed to teach the children of Israel, the word of God. I'm going somewhere. They defeated completely. Not only that, they, be, they began to pursue money. Widows, they would confiscate their properties. They were supposed to be judges. The priests and the Levites were supposed to be the judges of Israel. And the people who were supposed to be judges, they were the ones that were perpetrating injustice. Corruption in the society. Many of them began to form alliance with the Romans, their colonial master, okay, to defraud the people. That's what happened. Another group rose up who were the Pharisees. The Pharisees were not priests. They were just ordinary people who were fervent initially. They said, we must obey the law of Moses. And before you knew it, they started heaping up their own traditions Many traditions to circumvent the law of God. For example, the Lord Jesus Christ said, he said, honor your father and your mother. 
so that you may live long on the land that I've given to you. The Pharisees invented their own. They said, if you give anything, the things you are supposed to give to your parents, and you say you have given it to God, they said if you call it koban, it means that you have dedicated it to God, that you don't need to honor your parents, which is happening today. Yes. Some ministers of God actually teach their members to dishonor their parents and to bring all their things, their goods, their money to them. Some will even say your parents are witches. They will say it's your mother that is after you. And you should distance yourself. Mothers, it's usually mothers they talk about. Yes. Fathers are safe in a way. They say it's your mother that is after you. So exactly what the Pharisees were doing in those days. We are doing it now. They said, bring it to the church. You don't need to remember them. You have a spiritual father. Mm. And they replace, the, they replace your parents with themselves. That's what they do. They say they are your fathers. Okay? And then we have the scribes. The scribes too. So these two group of people became the teachers in Israel. Because the priest has been priesthood has been corrupted. So these two group of people were the ones that the majority of the children of Israel were following. And so that's why when you read the New Testament, especially the four gospel, you will always be reading the scribe and the Pharisees, the scribe, because at that time, they are taking the position of the priesthood. They are the ones who are now teaching the masses of the children of Israel. So they were the clergy. And that's why Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribe and Pharisees, but because you hold the key of knowledge, you will not enter the kingdom, and you will not allow those who will enter the kingdom to enter. That was the agony in the heart of Jesus. Because at that time, they became the clergy. And so whatever they say, the people follow them. In fact, the Lord Jesus said, they sit in the seat of Moses. That's how powerful they became. And so we see that human beings has always had the tendency to deviate from the defined pattern. So when we say building according to pattern, it's a very important topic that we need to consider. And that pattern is the divine instruction in the scripture. So we see that in the Old Testament, they deviated. The priesthood deviated from the divine instruction, they became corrupted. They were not doing what God said through Moses to them. And another group who were not even called to teach the Israelites arose to occupy their position. And that group was also corrupt. Very corrupt. They just paid attention to outside holiness. And we have, we have some churches who are like that today too. They are like the Pharisees who pay attention only to the outside holiness. The corruption in the art. Even though they preach holiness, there is still pride. The pride of life. In fact, they are usually given to the pride of life. That in what corruption is left unchecked. But thou shall not dress like this. I'm not saying people should dress indecently. A child of God should know that you should not dress indecently. No. If you are dressing decently, it means that your heart is corrupt. Mm -hmm. That's not what I am saying. Thou shall not do this, thou shall not do that, thou shall not do that. That's what they say. But the corruption, the pride of life, they have not dealt with it. And it always manifests. So that's what we see in the group called the Pharisees and the scribe, which took the place of the clergy in the Old Testament at the time of Christ. Now, what is priesthood in the New Testament? We see Jesus as the high priest. We see Jesus as the high priest who offered himself. If you can help me with some of those scriptures. Now, we see Jesus as the high priest. That is uh, Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 14 to 16. 
So we see Jesus. He said, since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. The King James Version said our infirmities. But one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are without, but yet without sin. Let us then confidently draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So we see that Jesus, there are other scriptures. Okay, Hebrews 6, 20. Hebrews 7, 26. But this will suffice for now. So we see Jesus, he offered himself, unlike the other priests who used to offer animals, goats, and cow, as, and sheep as offering. Jesus offered himself. He is the high priest and he is the sacrifice. Not only is the sacrifice, the place of atonement, the mercy seat, Jesus is he. That's the kind of high priest he is. Not only that, we see that after Jesus has sacrificed himself as the perfect offering to God, something significant happened in the temple in Jerusalem. The veil of the temple, that curtain that hides the mercy seat, was torn into two from top to bottom. Just like somebody said, top to bottom. <laughs> that happened. And what is that saying? He's saying that the way to the holiest of all, the only place, the holiest place in the universe has been opened to everyone that has faith in Jesus Christ. So, what are we saying? Jesus has opened the way to the very presence of the Father, where the Father sits. You have access to that place this morning. In fact, as you are seated now, you are seated there. That's where you are. That's what the high priest has done for us. So when people place themselves, we'll get to that soon. In a position as if they are your representative before God, it is a lie from the pit of hell. It's a lie. Because you are standing in the very presence of God. That is your position. Jesus has made that entrance for you. And that's why he said, having them boldness to enter into the holiest of all. By what? By the blood of Jesus Christ. And the Bible went further to say in the book of Ephesians, he said, we are seated with him in the heavenlies. And that same scripture also said that Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. So, beloved, as you are seated now, where are you seated? You are seated at the right hand of God. That's what the high priest has done for us. So when people say open heaven, I just laugh. There is nothing like open heaven for the believer in Christ. Because where are you seated? At the right hand of God in heaven. That's where you are seated. So you don't need any other open heaven. The day your heaven opened was that day when you submitted yourself to Christ. When you were saved. That day you got born again. That was the day your heaven opened. Not only was your heaven open, you were translated from heart to heaven. That's where you are seated now. Yes, that's where you are seated. So all these people that are making themselves so important, now there's a place for leadership, we'll talk about it. And see if, if you don't see them, you cannot see God. Now, when you have this knowledge, sometimes it will look as if you are proud. They will say you are proud, actually. They will not like you. Mm, because many of the things you run at us get for, you can kneel down in your room and say, Father, please do it for me. And he will do it. So you don't need to be jumping from one mountain to another. That's what Jesus has done for you. Okay? Now let's move forward. Now we now have... 
Interestingly, contrary to what we have today, that you have clergy and you have lady, even though they may not call themselves clergy and, and lady, they may not say it to you, but that is the disposition. That is what is in their heart. And that's the way they act. They make it look as if you are inferior to them. Now, what does the Bible say about all of us are clergy? All of us, you, you are clergy. You are a priest. That's what the Bible says. Let's look at 1 Peter 2 5. He said, You yourself, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So, can you see from the Bible that you are a priest? You are you belong to the clergy. There is nothing like laity as far as the Bible is concerned. All of us, we are priests. Okay, let's look at another scripture. I usually like to use more than one scripture because the Bible, Jesus himself said, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. So let's look at 1 Peter 2, 9. It says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, or people of his own possession. That's what this translation, the English Standard Version says. He said, a people for his own possession. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, the prosperity gospel has made it think that if you don't have money, you are wretched. It makes us look that the rich, the powerful, who are not saved, they are better than you. And you will see them, they actively look for access to those who have money, even though they are not saved. And so they make you look inferior. But if you look at this scripture, it said you are a special possession of God. What kind of privilege can be greater than that? He said, you are a holy nation, a royal priesthood. Now, that intention of God for the children of Israel that did not come to pass has now come to pass for the church of Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. That intention that didn't come to pass for Israel because they were just misbehaving, it came to pass for the church. Now, it is human craftiness. That wants to change what God has done. And what God has done, the Bible says, nothing can be added to it, neither can anything do what? Yes, whatsoever God does, we abide forever. So let's go back to the scriptures. So, can we see now? We are priests. Now let's move on. But we must understand, unlike Christ, we cannot atone for anybody's sin. Why? We are not perfect. We are we were all sinners before God made us saints. Even when we become saints, once in a while we still sin. And we say, Father, please forgive me. And so we cannot atone for anybody's sin. That's number two. So you are a priest of the second order. The first order priest is Jesus and Jesus alone. Okay? Secondly, we cannot mediate between man and God. Uh, you need a perfect person to be the mediator. And the only perfect human being who has ever lived was Jesus Christ. So that's why it could only be the mediator between God and man. We are not mediators between God and man. So what are the privileges of this priesthood? Direct access to God. We have said it. You have direct access to God. Let nobody bamboozle you. That's what I usually say. Some of you who read my writings on Facebook, you see, I say, let no man bamboozle you. I like that word. <laughs> let nobody bamboozle you. Okay? You have direct access. I have, as you are standing, do you know where you are? In the very presence of God. Now, this idea of secular and spiritual. You know, when people are in church, they believe they are serving God. When they are outside the church, they are not serving God. 
And so that's why when you are in your place of work, you mistreat your customers. You mistreat your co-workers because you do not know that at that time in the place of work, you are in the very presence of God while you are mistreating your customers and your co-workers. Now, so for the child of God, the secular spiritual dichotomy does not exist because you are always in the presence of God. And so they say, let us welcome the presence. I understand there is the manifest, the manifest presence of God. Okay? Yes. Maybe that's what people mean when they say, let's welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit. Maybe they are saying, let us welcome the manifest. Now, the thing is that when children of God are present, two or three, there is always the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit. And now, if you, are, if you are spiritual, you will feel it when it comes. That's why I find it very difficult. I know some Christians, they listen to secular music. That's why I, cannot, I, don't, I don't listen to secular music. I can listen to it on radio. Maybe a radio host is playing it. And usually once they start playing those dirty songs, I will stop it. But if it's just poetry and those things, I can allow it. But my own, if I want to play music, I play Christian music. And the reason is that when you play Christian music that are, that are, that are the inspiration is from scripture, that are scripturally balanced, you see the presence of the, the manifest presence of the descend where you are. I don't know whether uh, there's a witness here. I enjoy that presence. When, when I play secular music, I don't see that. I don't, I don't, that presence does not come. So that's the manifest presence. I enjoy that presence. So maybe that's what people say when they say, let us welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit. But in reality, 24 7, even when you are sleeping, you are in the presence of God. And for married couples, mm -hmm, even when you are doing the do, you are in the presence of God. Do you understand now? So there, the secular spiritual dichotomy does not exist for the child of God. Okay? So, we have direct access to God. That's number one. Number two, in 1 Peter 2, 5 says, you yourself are like living stone are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices. Now, Peter did not say what are those sacrifices. He just said that we are supposed to continue to do what? To offer spiritual sacrifices unto God. So what are the sacrifices that we offer to God? Number one, the number one sacrifice we must offer to God is our bodies. Let's look at the scripture. It says, Romans 12, 1 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. He said, and do not be conformed to this word, but be renewed, what? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So, how do we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice? When temptation comes for us to sin, we say no to temptation and we say yes to God. When the Holy Spirit gives us instruction, we say yes to the Holy Spirit and say no to ourselves. That's why the Bible, Jesus said, he said, anybody that will follow me, he must do what? Firstly, deny himself. Carry his cross daily and follow me. What does that mean? There are times God's demand is not pleasing to the flesh. Your flesh says no. Okay? But what do you do? You deny yourself and say yes to the spirit of the Lord. Paul in Galatians says, he said, he said that we should walk in the spirit. Okay? So that we know what? The flesh. He said for the spirit what? Struggles against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit 
and the two are contrary, so that you cannot do the things that you are supposed to do. What? Any sincere, that's why all these people that they are saying that they have been sanctified. I mean, they have instantaneous sanctification that has removed the root of the flesh. It's not, it does not conform to the scriptures. If you are sincere with yourself, you will see that there is always a struggle in your heart. The flesh is saying, do this. Why? The spirit within is saying, my son, mm -mm. no, 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 no. You will not do that. Is there anybody here who does not have that struggle? Is there anyone here who has the struggle? Yes. So, that is how the, Paul said we should consider our self dead unto sin and alive unto Christ. So that's why we, how we offer sacrifices to God through our body. Okay, the fruit of our body should be holiness, righteousness, and not iniquity and sin. Just as we have yielded ourselves unto iniquity and unto unrighteousness in the past, now that we are Christians, now that we believe in Christ, we should yield ourselves unto righteousness and unto holiness in the presence of God. So that's the way we offer sacrifices with our body. The second way that we offer sacrifice to God with our body is the renewing of our mind. What is Paul talking about renewing of our mind? There are traditions and conventions that we have imbibed while we were in the world. When we now get born again, we should use the scripture to dethrone those conventions and norms. For example, for the married people in Yoruba land, your family is more important than your wife. And so even your possession, when a man dies, the family come and dispossess the woman. Even when they, have, they, they still have little children that are, have not finished their schooling, the family can be so cruel. They come and say, it's my brother, and collect everything and dispossess the woman. That is unscriptural because the Bible says the two shall what? Shall become one. And you must, you must break away from that tradition. If you don't break away from that mentality, you can never be one with your wife. That's not say that you will not help your family member, but your wife is number one. Okay? Now, again, in family finances, in Yoruba land and in Africa, we believe that the man should do everything. The money of the woman belongs to her, while the money of the man belongs to the family. That is wrong. It's not scriptural. You should do things together. You should not keep money at, in, bank, in your bank account when you are, your, your husband is struggling to pay the school fees of the children. I say, he should be his dear father. Let him pay it now. <laughs> but it happens even among Christians. When you ask her, she will even lie. She will say, I don't have money. Lying. And all liars will do what? Uh -huh, you better repent. I will say all liars who did not repent. So you have chance to repent now. It is not true. The little you are bringing, you should bring it to the table. Yes, it's not only the man. And young sisters, remove all those mentality from your brain. Again, the word is telling us now that, you know, what the Holy Spirit is bringing, let me say it, that the husband and the wife, they are the same. I will say it. I know they will say, <laughs> I'm controversial, that there is no head. There should be, the two of them should submit to each other. That's what the world is saying now. 
But that is anti-scripture. The scripture says, husband, love your wife. And wife, submit to the husband. That's what the scripture says. Don't let us change the Bible. There is no boat without a captain. If there is no captain in a boat, that boat will capsize. And that's why many families are capsizing because there is no captain. There has to be a captain. But a loving captain. Yes. A loving captain. Who will consider his wife as his own flesh. That's what the Holy Spirit is bringing to my spirit. So I don't want to, I don't want to run away from it. Initially I wanted to remove it but... I have to say, that's what the scripture says. A loving captain. So that his sheep will not capsize. Young sisters, remove all those things from your mind. And then, young men. I have said a loving captain. It's not saying you should become a dictator captain. Mm. Mm -mm. That's not what the scripture says. He, in fact, that captain, the scriptures say he should give his life for what? For his wife. Now, when we understand this role, a wife will not try to lead the family. Because the Bible never said that the wife should give his life for the husband or her life for the husband. It's the husband, Jesus and the scriptures say, should give his life for the wife. So why do you want to take a responsibility that God has not given you? Because that responsibility is even more powerful. It's even more demanding than the one the scripture gives to you. Don't change it. Praise the Lord. Now let's move forward. Now as we will be having some digression here and there as the Holy Spirit brings them. Okay? Now so our bodies, we submit to God the renewing of our minds. All those fortresses and castles that the world has built in our mind, we must use the word of God. I have addressed two of them already. There are many of them that the world has built in our minds. We should address them with the word of God as the spiritual weapon and dethrone them and let Christ be enthroned. That is one of the ways that we offer ourselves as sacrifices unto God. The second sacrifice that the scripture says that priests in the Bible should give is to do good. Is giving. Yes, voluntary giving. Nobody is forcing you. Nobody is coercing you. But sometimes the Lord prompts your heart. Give to this person. Or sometimes somebody asks you and you have. If you don't have, fine. I always say that if God wants me to give something to somebody, he will have given it to me. So if I don't have, I don't feel guilty anymore. Uh, that means God has a provision for that person somewhere here, uh, some, uh, elsewhere. That's what it means. But if you have, the meek of kindness should make you to give. Okay, so let's look at scriptures. He said, in Philippians 4, 15 to 18, he said, and you Philippians yourself know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. In verse 18, Paul said, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied. Having received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. So you see when you give to people and you are kind to people, it's not just money alone. Let's look at scriptures again before I talk. He said, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. 
For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So we see that when we give, and when we are kind, somebody, for example, you are a student, you know something. Your tutorial group, they don't know it. When you stand up and teach them, you are giving. So giving is not only money. When somebody does not have clothes, okay, and you give him clothes, you have given. In fact, I have cultivated one habit. When I have, it's not as if I have so, much, so many clothes. I can't even use so many clothes at the same time. Now, many a times, my wife will buy clothes for me. He will say, you don't have clothes, she will go and buy it. And give it to me. Sometimes she will even find Taylor. And say, Taylor, sew it for him. Now, sometimes I notice that some of these clothes, I've not worn them for some months. So I gather them together. I bundle them out. That is giving. It doesn't have to be money alone. Okay, praise the Lord. And then the last one, it says, through him, then let us continually offer up sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our leaf that acknowledges his name. So when you sing praises to God, or when you praise God, even when you cannot sing, it's not everybody that can sing. Some people, when they sing, they use kizad to sing. <laughs> Do you know what the Bible says? God sees it as an aroma coming from your heart to him. That's a special offering that you are offering to God. So when you are singing to him, when you are praising him, when you are worshiping him, sometimes, even, <laughs> we'll talk about this later, sometimes when I am praying, I get into the spirit and I sing in the spirit. Yes, yes so when people say you can no longer be baptized in the Holy Spirit and you can speak in tongues, I say, that's not scriptural. You can pray in tongues, you can sing in the spirit, but usually it's the Holy Spirit that will motivate you. I just find that I'm singing in the spirit. God understand what I am singing. I don't know what I am singing. That is an offering to God. So that's part of the sacrifices we are supposed to offer to God. Now, universal ministry of the priest. In Romans 12, 3 to 8, Paul outlined the ministry to the body of Christ. Okay? He said, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned to him. Now, this faith that Paul is talking about is faith for service to the body of Christ. He's not talking about faith in Christ that saves you. That's not what he's talking. He's not talking about saving faith. It's faith to use the gift that God has given to you. For example, God has given me the gift of teaching. I can teach. I also notice he has given me the grace to counsel, to give godly counsel. Now, those are the ones I know. There may be others. I don't know them yet. Okay? Now the ones that you have known. Some people is doing good. All of us should do good. But these people, they find it so easy to do good. Let's look at scripture. He said, For as in one body, we have many members. And the members do, do not all have the same function. He says, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individual members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service, can you see service? You see, they can give their eyes out. It's a gift. Yes. And some of them were not like that until they got born again. That's to tell you that it's a gift. It's not everybody that is like that. Yes, all of us are to give. But these people, you know them. When they are around you, they can give their... There's nothing they cannot give. That is the service the scripture is saying. Not only that, there are people who are good at organization. When people want to, like this meeting now, it's not everybody that can organize this kind of meeting. So when you know them, use them. It's a gift. 
Let's use them. I don't like forcing myself to do what I, I, don't, I cannot do. I, I, when, when I cannot do it, I, for example, my wife is very good at organizing things. So I let her do the organization. I just give her support. I just give her support here and there. And then sometimes I say, ah, why don't you do it this way? I don't struggle with her in that area because I know that she does these things with ease. There is something we are doing now. She's doing organizing everything. So I don't struggle with that. It's only sometimes when I, when I feel that there should be a little adjustment here and there, I will just suggest it to her. So there are people in the body of Christ who have that ability. So we should allow them to manifest it. Praise the Lord. Now he said, the one who exhorts, exhausts, exhorts, sorry, that is those who give words of encouragement. Now, such people may not be able to teach like I'm teaching now. But when it comes to encouraging people, to lifting people up, ah, they can do it. We should let them do it. We will see what the lady, uh, sorry, the clergy lady dichotomy has done to all these gifts. That's why you rarely see some of these gifts anymore. There are brethren in the church that have all these gifts. Praise the Lord. Now, he said, the one who teaches, Paul says, let him that speak, what? He should speak as the oracle of God. That is when you are speaking for God. You should speak as if God is speaking. You should prepare yourself to such a place, spiritually, you should saturate your spirit with the word of God and pray at to the extent that the Holy Spirit can take over your spirit and use it to speak. That's what it means to speak as the oracle of God. And sometimes when you are speaking, the Holy Spirit will witness or minister to your spirit to say what it looks like a digression. Hey, speak it just like I wanted to run away this morning. Don't run away from it. Even when it is not convenient, go ahead and say it. That's what it means to speak as the oracle of God. So when you are ministering, he, he said, he that teacheth, let him teach. Okay? So we should teach. He said, the one who exhorts, exhort, the one who teaches, let him teach. He said, the one who contributes. Those are the giving people I'm talking about. Let them do it. In generosity. And the one who leads, the administrators of the church, the leaders of the church, what did he say they should do? He said, with zeal. And the one who does the act of mercy, what does he say? Let him do it with cheerfulness. Now you can see that, if you look at this list, you see that there's nobody who is not gifted. That's what we, the first thing that will immediately appear to you is that it's not only those who are preaching or are teaching or who are pastors or who are evangelists that are supposed to minister to the body of Christ. All of us are supposed to be ministering to the body of Christ with our gifts. We should not bury. And Jesus said, he said on that day, the kingdom of God is like a master who is going away and gave talent to his household. He gave some people five, he gave some people three, and he gave the other one, he gave him one. The one who has five, he used it and gained five. The one who has three, or is it two now, used it and gained two more. And the one who has one decided to go and bury it. There is nobody who is born again who is not gifted to minister to the body of Christ. No one. If you look at this list, there is no one. So the idea of some people, and when you minister that gift to the body of Christ, you are ministering as what? As a priest. It's not only those who are preaching like, or teaching like I'm doing now that are ministering to the body of Christ. Now, let's move forward. Now, the other privilege is ministry to the world through evangelism. You said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creation or to the whole creation. Or to every creature. He said we should go. So that's evangelism. We said we are ambassadors of Christ. 
And we are appealing to you that you should be reconciled unto God. So that's one way we minister. And all of us are supposed to be ministering to the world. Okay? The next one, he says, again, through our work. You know, I have said, we have said before now that there is no distinction between secular and spiritual. We are supposed to minister to the world through our work. And so when you are a shopkeeper and the customer come and you talk to them rudely, you have not ministered. Mm. When you are a teacher and you don't take time to understand the subject before you go to class to teach those young children, you are not ministering, you know. You are not performing your priestly function. Because that teaching you are doing in your class every day, you are ministering as a priest of God. And so when you don't prepare, you don't even understand the subject. I find that subjects that are difficult is usually because the teacher doesn't teach well. They say mathematics is difficult. It's because many of the t- people who teach mathematics don't even know mathematics. Yes. Many of the people who teach physics, chemistry, don't know it. When we were in secondary school, we used to have a chemistry teacher. He would go and take Lambert. Who knows that textbook, Lambert? <laughs> yes, I do know it. He would copy Lambert. He would just copy Lambert and write it on the board and be reading it to us in the class. That's what he used to do. <laughs> now, if that person were a Christian, and I suppose that man was a child of God then, we would say he was ministering. He's not. Okay, if you think what I am saying is not true, let's look at scripture. I usually like to back. He said, bond servant. It's just like employee now. Uh, we don't have bond servant again. He said, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service, as, a, as people please us, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord, whatever you do, work earthly, as for the Lord and not for men. Can you see? King James says, as unto the Lord and not unto man. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. So even the secular work we are talking about, when you are doing it, it is Jesus you are serving. And when we have this mentality that, ah, this person sitting be, before me is Jesus. Who, I mean, yes. You will treat him better. Praise the Lord. Now, and then through intercessory prayers. Let's look at, I don't have it here. Please help me to bring it. First Timothy 2, 1 to 4. Intercessory prayer for the world, for saints, for rulers, for everybody. When we pray, okay, he said, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayer, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Please proceed for that. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all goodness and honesty. Next one. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. First of all, who will have all men to be saved? And to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So the other way that we minister as priests is through intercessory prayer. Both for the saints, for the unsaints, for kings, for rulers, for everybody. As you pray for people, you are standing in your priestly office. And speaking to God on behalf of men. Praise the Lord. Now equality among Believers, that's another problem. Many of us don't know that we have it. And so we see people, he said, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you, you all are brothers. And call no man your father or not, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, that is, neither be called masters. For you have one instructor, you have one master, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. So we see from scriptures that 
as far as God is concerned, even though we have different functions and role in the church, in the body of Christ, we are all equal as far as God is concerned. And Jesus said, you should not call anybody your father. Does it mean I should not call my dad my dad, even though he's late now? No, that's not what Jesus is saying. He was talking about the Pharisees who believe that they are the spiritual fathers of the children of Israel. And when you say a father, he is the person through who you came from. You came to the world. So, spiritually, the Pharisees and the scribes, they see themselves as the father of faith. Uh -huh. So Jesus, we are not the only one confronting these things now. Jesus also confronted it during his time on earth. And they believe that their word is finer. They believe they are the only one who have access to God. Even when they are misinterpreting scriptures. Yes, they are the fathers. Don't we have them in Nigeria? Many misinterpreting scripture, murdering the scriptures, and yet they are spiritual fathers of they are fathers of faith. And Jesus said, Don't consider any of them as your father. The only father you have, and there can be no other spiritual father. The only you can have mentors, you can have elders. Yes, there are elders, there are mentors. The only spiritual father we have. Is God. It's only God who can burn spirit. No human being can give out to a spirit. So, the only spiritual father we have, so all of us, we are brothers. And in the, in the when we first got to be born again, we used to call ourselves brothers. Hey, these brother and sister, we used to call ourselves. Now they say we should be calling them papa. We should be calling them mama. Somebody that, in faith, at least, the Lord brought me in before them. I should call them Papa and Mama. By age, I'm older than them. What kind of Papa and Mama is that one? Even small children. Small children in their 20s. They want to be Papa. They want to be Mama. Abba. Papa call. So we have the privilege of being equal in Christ. There shouldn't be any reason why I cannot call somebody brother or sister. Now, because of our culture, yes, if somebody is old enough to be my father, I can say daddy. But it's not daddy of faith. I'm calling him daddy because he's old enough to be my father. It's not daddy of faith. The only daddy of faith I have is God. He can be my leader. He can be an elder. That's what Jesus is saying. There is no father of faith anywhere. The only father of faith we have is God. And he also says that the only master that you have, what he's saying is that the only authority, spiritual authority that you have, when it comes to instructions, is what? It's Jesus Jesus has given us his word in the four gospels. He made sure those four gospels are preserved. Not only that, he also said when he was going, he said, I have many things that I want to say to you, but you cannot take them now. He said, but when I have left, the Holy Spirit will come, the spirit of truth, and he will lead you into all truth. And so we see that the writings of the apostles of Christ and their associates were those things that he said he wanted to tell them, he could not tell them. So we have the epistles. So anything you cannot find in the epistles of the apostles of Christ, uh -uh. trash them. Praise the Lord. Because the final authority, the only authority that you have as regards instruction is what? Christ. So that brings all of us to the same level. 
So it is horizontal relationship we have. There is no vertical relationship in the body of Christ. Even though since the apostles left, the last apostle left, which was John, yes, the elders of the church have tried to create a vertical relationship. Mm, and they are still doing it now. In the body of Christ, there is no such thing as vertical relationship. All of us, horizontal relationship. That's what we have in the body of Christ. And you must allow this thing to sink into you. If it does not sink, they will make you do things that you are not supposed to do. When we get further to the real evils, and you know, we can't be talking about those evils without laying this foundation we are laying. You will see why they exploit women more. Yes. The abuse is common against women. And you must know today that you have no vertical relationship to anybody in the body of Christ except Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit. Those are the ones you have vertical relationship with. Every other relationship is peer relationship. Vertical, sorry, horizontal on the ground. Praise the Lord. Now, so we see that he said we we are all brethren, though our assignments differ. Priesthood, there, therefore, is not limited to the ministers of the world. It's not just those who preach or those who teach that are priests. It's also not limited to the leaders of the local church. Maybe just the pastors and the body of elders in the church. Priesthood is not limited to them. So we must understand that. Now, does it mean when we say we have a horizontal relationship, does it mean, I hope my time, please let me know how much time I have now left for this session. 10 minutes. Oh, 30 more minutes. Okay, so I can still take this. Okay. So, sorry, 10 minutes for teaching? Okay. Okay, so I have 10 more minutes to talk. Okay, so let's go. I think I can still take part of this before. Now, does it mean that there is no leadership structure in the church? You know, some people, the advocate of the church house, they are saying everybody is the same. There should be no leadership. Where there is no leadership, where there is no captain, the ship will go, we capsize. It's going to sink. That movement, that movement, I fear for that movement. Because the ancient pattern, the biblical pattern says that there is leadership in the house of God. And so what does he entail? Very simple. So the New Testament has a West structure leadership, contrary to what some advocate of our churches teach. So when you encounter those, some of them are our friends on Facebook. Sometimes when they say those things, I refuse to talk because I know their minds are made up. Now, sometimes I gauge people's spirit. Yes, you will know. You will know before you engage somebody, you will know somebody who will be receptive and somebody who will not be receptive. I already know that you will not be receptive. Sometimes I engage because I want to help those who are reading, especially if it's on, on my wall. But if it's not on my wall, many a times I don't engage because I already know this person in my spirit, this person is not going to be receptive. So why should I waste my energy? Now, we have some of them as our friends. I have refused to engage them because I know for now they will not accept it. There is leadership. Mm -hmm. There is. So, God is a God of order. God is a God of order. So, who are the leaders in the church? Elders. They are also the one called bishop. Now, when somebody calls himself bishop today, I make him look as if he's one big title. It's a lie. A bishop, just, bishop just means overseer. It also means, it, can, it also means elder. 
It's the Roman Catholic God that changed the meaning. It just means you are an overseer. It just means you are a leader. That's what it means. Okay? Okay? It means elder or overseer. So, now there are two words in the scriptures that are used for this position. Elder and overseer, which the King James Version says bishop. Now, you must understand that the King James Version is biased. When I say it now, some of you may want to stone me. You must understand that the King James Version is biased in the terminology of the scriptures, especially the New Testament. I'll tell you some of the bias. And they did it because to support the leadership of the Anglican church. Yes. All the scholars of the old King James Version, they were all Anglican. In fact, one of the instructions the king gave them was that to preserve the ecclesiology and the leadership structure of the Anglican church. So when people present the King James Bible as a perfect Bible and all other Bible versions as, as heretic, is a lie. And so when you see church, church actually means congregation or assembly. That's the proper word that is supposed to be there. When you see bishop, what is supposed to be there is overseer. It's not bishop. Okay? When you see baptism, they decided to leave baptism because of infant baptism. What is supposed to be there is immersion into water. Because they don't practice immersion into water. There are several other terminologies that they refuse to interpret in the way they are written in the original Greek text to preserve the order in the Anglican church. So that's why it is good for you to use your Greek concordance, your Hebrew concordance, and then to read other new versions that are reliable, like the English standard version I'm using now, okay, like the NIV. Some people say NIV is heretic. It's not heretic. Okay? So you must understand that, that some of those terminologies were left to preserve that order in the Anglican church. So bishop means overseer. And those two words are used interchangeably in the New Testament. Let's see a few scriptures. Maybe I will just stop at this level. You see, he said, therefore, an overseer, that is a, that, now, the English standard fashion, no, the English, yes, standard fashion is using the appropriate word now. He said, now, therefore, an overseer, that's First Timothy 3, 2, must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-control, respectable, hospitable, and able to teach. He was listing the criteria for selecting an elder in the church. Okay? Now, look at the same instruction being given to Titus. Eh? To Titus. This was instruction to Timothy. Now, the instruction, he said, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remains into order and appoint elders in every... You can see that those two words are used inter interchangeably. Episcopos and press Presbyteros. Those two words are used interchangeably. There is no distinction between an elder and an overseer, which we call bishop today. There are several other instances in the scripture, but at least I've shown you two. You see? And they did so, sending us at 11.30, sending to the elders, and which is the presbyter, by the hands of Saul and Barnabas. This place is talking about the gift that the Antioch church sent to Jerusalem. He said, who did they give it to? They give it to the elders. Now, in some other place, to save time, in, in Acts of Apostles, they will say, the apostles and the elders of the Jerusalem church. Now, we must know that initially, the, the body that governed the Jerusalem church was basically the apostles initially. Okay? But with time, as more people got born again, and there are now more gifted people, the apostles decided to select those gifted people and join them with themselves. 
And that forms the body that governed the Jerusalem church. And Peter went forward to say, not just to see that the apostles were also elders. When you look at 1 Peter 5.1, he said, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. So the apostles were also elders. They didn't separate themselves. It was just that Christ called them to be apostles. But when it comes to governing the body of Christ at that time, even the non-apostles who were selected to be part of the body that governed the church, all of them were called elders, including Peter, which seems to be the most eminent of the apostles because Jesus said, what? Feed my sheep. He was the one the Lord gave that instruction. And when it was time to open the gate for the Gentiles to come to Christ, it was still the one the Lord selected to open that gate to the Gentiles. But even at that, he equated himself with the body of elders that governed the church of Christ. So we see that one of the things we must see about this is that it was a plural group. It was, it was not just one body, one person. Unlike we have today, just one pastor who is unquestionable. They put themselves in the position of God. It's only God you cannot question. Even God said we should ask him questions. When you ask them questions, they will go and pray that God should strike you down. And sometimes coincidences happen. Something happens to you which is just maybe in God's plan. God wants it to happen to you. And then they will not say it is because he asked me a question. That's why that thing happened to him. In the beginning, it was never so. Please permit me to finish this thing. It looks like the Lord wants me to say this thing. Let me say them. Now, we must see to it. The idea of a single pastor ruling the church never existed in the, Old Test in the, in the New Testament church. Now, now, when we read the New Testament church, it seems as if there is somebody, a presiding elder amongst the elder. Yes. But it wasn't like a dictatorial kind of leadership that we have today. In many places, it was a presiding elder who consulted the other elder. That was James. James, in the act of the apostle, you will see that the Bible says that Paul came to James and the what? And the elders. When it was time for him to be arrested, when he came back from his journey, he said he went to James and the elders. It seems as if the other apostles, so maybe they had left Jerusalem at that time and they left the church with him. And so James and the other elders were the ones that were governing the Jerusalem church. Even when it, at the time of the Jerusalem council, the first church council, when they wanted to debate about circumcision, whether it was necessary and to keep the ceremonial law of Moses. Who presided over that meeting? It was James. But with what? The council, council of the elders and the apostles. Even though he was a presiding elder, he didn't take a unilateral decision. It was a joint decision. Oh God. Now, let's look, let's look for that. So that idea, let's look at the way in the Gentile churches. How were they governed? Paul already said to Timothy, he said you should elect elders. Now, some people, in a bit to justify one single bishop in a church, they said Timothy was the bishop. Never! He was not. He was an apostolic worker. Timothy was not, was not a bishop. The elders were the bishops of the local churches that he ordained. He was an apostolic worker. He was an apostolic associate. That he was working on behalf of Paul. Of the apostle, because Paul could not go there physically, he sent him as an emissary to go and put in order the things that were not in order. So, the, let's look at what Paul said he should do. Uh, what, 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 what they were doing there, he said, and when they had appointed elders for them in every church, how many elders? Elders. Didn't say they appointed just one pastor for them. So, the governing body that governs a local church should not be one person in the New Testament. 
It should be a body of elders. Yes, for convenience sake, there will be somebody that is presiding over that council. Just like we have in the Jerusalem church. But every decision taken will be jointly taken. This idea that I have vision to build churches all over the world. I have vision to build a cathedral. And then you ask all the church members to be contributing money for the largest building in the world. We can't find it in the Bible. That is human ambition because of lack of plurality of elders in the church. We are in the scripture. Have you ever found? He said, go ye into all the world. He didn't say congregate together. The local church is actually supposed to be, the Lord will permit us someday to talk about what the local church is supposed to be. It's supposed to be small, actually. It's not supposed to be big. No. It's not supposed to be a mega church. The idea of mega church is human carnality. It's human ambition. We don't find such things in the scriptures. So what we find in the scripture is a plurality of elders, a governing body of elders, who jointly, every decision, important decision, will be jointly taken. That's what we see in the Bible. Praise the Lord. Now, let's look at another scripture. He said, okay, we have already said, he said, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remain in, in, into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Again, elders. That's what the New Testament says. So Titus was not the bishop to Crete. He was an apostolic emissary, an apostolic worker sent by Paul to ordain. And a, any church that does not have this plural elder is not, is not complete. That's what Paul was saying there. He said to put in, in order that which remained. That means if a local church does not have a plural elder, that church is not complete. That's what he's saying. So we see that the first layer of leadership in the New Testament church, the elders, which is a group. And then the second layer, which is the last layer, uh, sorry, not the last layer necessarily, the deacons. And this came out of necessity. Now, there were Hellenists, I mean, Jews who went to Greek-speaking countries. And then they came back home. And they got born, born again. And they joined the church. And so when they were contributing, you know, they were bringing everything to the apostles' feet. And they were sharing. As they were sharing, those who were sharing were biased. They were giving it to only the own people. The abroad people. They neglected the widows among the abroad people. You see that partiality has always been everywhere. So they were giving the widows who were at home. Maybe in their mind they are saying, hey, who asked you to travel now? <laughs> Just like if somebody comes from abroad, abroad and you say, hey, me money go travel abroad. <laughs> so it was like that. Oh, Jakarta, the people that Jakarta. <laughs> so they were not giving them. And so they started complaining. That, ah, why is it that it's only the own people that you are giving? The Jakarta people, you are not giving them. Why? And the apostle said, yes, it's true. This complaint is genuine. But we cannot do that. We are supposed to give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. That's what, if you are a minister of the word, don't encumber yourself with activity. You need time to pray, to saturate your spirit with the word of God and prayer. So that you will not be speaking, you will not go and be doing motivational speaking. I can't do motivational speaking. <laughs> Nonsense. You don't, you, don't, you don't need to be born again to do motivational speaking. Even an atheist. That's not what I am called to do. I am called to be an oracle of God. So, praise the Lord. So, so, they said they cannot do that. And so, that's how the ministry of Dickens was battered. And we have some of them who are the one. And so you see that even after that, it became a consistent pattern in the local churches. See what Paul said. He said, 
In 1 Timothy 3, 8 to 13, he said, Deacons, likewise, he was given the criteria for selecting deacons who will assist the elders in the administration of the church must be dignified, not double tongued, not somebody who will say one thing here and go and say another thing in another place, not addicted to much wine, not that is not a drunkard, not greedy for dishonest gain. He said they must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first. You should not ordain them first. Test them with little, little assignment. If they do well, then you now ordain them. If they don't do well, remove them. That's what Paul is saying here. He said, their wives likewise must be dignified. It must not be a wife that will go and scatter the church with Gebonu. <laughs> eh? The wife of Dicky scattering the church. Be sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let the deacon each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their household well. For those who have served well as deacon gain a good standing for themselves and also the great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Now, in Philippians 1, Paul said to Timothy, Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints, in Christ, who are at Philippi, with what? The overseers and what? Now, these scriptures actually tell us all the structure of this church. The saints, the overseers, and the deacons. That's all. The New Testament church. So the leadership you have, the elders, and the deacons who assist the elder in administering the church. That is all that is needed in the church. Every other thing that you see today is human invention. It's not divinely inspired. This is divine inspiration. Anything outside this never was not inspired by God. It's the flesh that inspired it. Now let's move forward. But we also have gifted men. There are gifted men. It's not everybody that is gifted that will be part of the body of... So, usually, they usually consider those people. So, gifted men like teachers who are not part of the governing body of the church, evangelists who are not part of the governing body of the church, like Apollos. We never read anywhere that Apollo was part of the elder of a local church, but the church recognized him because of the genuine gift that he has. Those were the leadership, leader, leaders in the church of the, of the New Testament. Now, we must understand that these leaders were mutually submissive to themselves and to the brethren. And there are several examples in the scripture. This day that they will say, were you there when God called me? Was, you can never find it in the Bible. Were you, even when Paul was wrongly accused by the Corinthians, what did he do? He took his pen and explain, and explain, and explain, and explain. It didn't cost them. The, the major part of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, substantial part of it where Paul explaining that, I am a true apostle now. Can't you see? He didn't say, were you the one who called me? Did you see me when Jesus appeared to me? The oil that it, it was on my head, I will use it to curse you now. You never find that in the New Testament scriptures. They were submissive to themselves and to the brethren. Even when sometimes the brethren accused them wrongly. Let's look at a few examples and I will stop for this session. Now if you look at Acts, uh, we have already talked about the, the Dapa brethren that complained. Now did you see the apostles saying, how dare you talk to us, the apostle, we that we saw Jesus when he was alive. We are the, the witnesses to his resurrection. How dare you confront us? Is that, was that their response? No. Never. They said, yes, what you are saying is true. They defer to them and solve the problem. That is the way church leadership is supposed to be. Let's look at another example. Another example, you find it in Acts 11, that's a long one. In Acts 11, 
2 to 18. When after Peter went to the house of Cornelius, at that time, the brethren, the church brethren, they were majorly Jews. They had not gone out to preach to non-Jews. Now, the only non-Jews, Jews, I mean, not non-Israelites, non-Israelites that were part of the church at that time, were Gentiles who were already circumcised. Okay? They called them the proselyte of righteousness. Now, those people, they have become Jews, actually, even though they were not born as Israelites. Example of them was one of the deacon. I think Nicholas, they said he was a proselyte from Antioch. That means that he was a Gentile who was converted into Judaism. Now, another example is the Ethiopian eunuch was probably a Gentile who had been converted to Judaism. That's why he was reading the scripture of Isaiah. Okay? Those were the only people in the church at that time. Anybody who has not been converted to Judaism, they didn't even preach to them. And they believed that it was wrong. It's unclean. You see, blessed you from, from the Old Testament was still in their brain. Paul was one of those people who used the, script, the word of God to dismantle those things. Those are some of the strong goals that we should deal with. Now, because the church today, Judaism has entered. In fact, it's right, in fact, it has taken the place of Christ in some places. Yes. Uh, payment of tithe. Okay. Tithe. Firstborn redemption offering. Hmm? Uh, first fruit. Judaism. And sacrifices. Yes. Monetize a Shiloh sacrifice. They are all Judaism. We must use the word of God to confront them and to dismantle them. We must not be afraid. We must be bold for Christ. And we must declare the word of God as it is written in the scriptures. In as much as you are speaking according to the scripture, you have the backings of heaven. Now, so the circumcision party, they accused and accosted Peter. And they said to Peter, how dare you enter the house of a Gentile? You even ate with him. What did Peter say? Peter did not say, are you the one that Jesus commissioned to feed the sheep and the lamb? I am Peter the rock. Did he say that? No. no. The Bible says he took time and he explained everything from beginning to the end. And after he did that, what did they do? They agree with him and they glorify God. That's the way the church is supposed to be. Not only that, when Peter decided to misbehave, and you know, Kontalara, <laughs> uh, you know, he had that tendency to please people. That's one problem that Peter had. You know, he likes to please people. Ah, everybody be okay, be okay. So, he was with Paul and Barnabas and other brethren in Antioch. And when he came, the apostle, he was eating with everybody, felicitating with everybody, you know, just moving around. Oh, Peter, you are welcome, you are welcome. And then there are some brethren from, from Jerusalem who still believe that Jews should not mingle with Gentiles. And when Peter said them, he wanted to please them again. And he withdrew from the Gentile brethren. And they were doing it for days, not one day. Paul was looking at them and saying, ah, ah, Abba, Peter, you are supposed to be Baba now. Ah, ah, Abba, Abba. He was, he was thinking that Peter would change. Peter refused to change, though, to the point that Barnabas joined him. Ah, ah. So Paul was left alone. He said, eh, eh, I will talk now. <laughs> I cannot, the, the gospel is at stake. I will have to talk now. And in front of them all, he confronted Paul, uh, Peter. And he said, if you are already living like a Gentile, why are you forcing the Gentiles to li live like Jews? What's the meaning of this? This is hypocrisy. The Peter said, ah, me, I was ordained before you. Did you see Jesus physically? Eh? I slept with him. I ate with him. I even drank tea with him. <laughs> Did Peter 
Peter say that? No. Peter just went mellow and repented. That is it. Submission among one another. Mutual submission. And lastly, Paul and the other apostle. You would think with the abundance of revelation that Paul had, he would just be on his himself. He would not even be afraid as Jesus appeared to him. They, Jesus took him to the third heaven. They showed him things that you are not even supposed to say. Ah, you can't say it to if you, eh? no. no, 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 no. They've told you in heaven, this thing is for your personal consumption. You must not tell anybody. You will expect that. He will be proud. Look at what he said he did. He said, then after 14 years, I went again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along. I went up because of a revelation and said before them, though privately, before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaimed among the Gentiles, in order to make sure that I was not running or I had run in vain. Paul submitted himself to the apostles, all the revelation. He said, Imagine a whole Paul that I've gone to heaven. Somebody that has not died has got, gone to heaven. Not all these people that they will say they went to heaven and they will be telling us things that are not scriptural. This one went to re heaven. He still went to the apostles who are before him and said, Brethren, this is what I am preaching. You know? Are we sure this is correct? And after those people examined it, they said, You are okay. Right hand of fellowship. They only said, Please remember the poor. Which Paul was eager to do? That is the way it's supposed to be. When they say, It is, the Lord revealed it to me. It's a lie. And those things they said the Lord revealed to them. They said the Lord revealed to them to make people wealthy. To make millionaires. What kind of commission is that? That's a satanic commission. Where is the commission in the Bible? To preach the gospel to every creation. To make disciples of all nations. So that what? We may become like Christ, not to become millionaires. Yes, some of us will become millionaires. That's fine. But that's not the goal of the gospel. The goal of the gospel is to make you become like Jesus. Anything outside that is secondary. So God will never commission anybody. And they say it's Jesus that revealed it to them. And they are not afraid to subject that revelation to the scripture. Finally, in this session, the place of the Holy Spirit. It seems to me that in the early church, if the Holy Spirit will not move, they will not move. Even though it looks as if they were ignorant, they were reluctant. If Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in what? In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the world. Until the Holy Ghost moved, they did not move. In Samaria, the Holy Ghost moved Philip, even the apostles didn't go to Samaria. It was Philip that the Holy Ghost moved to go to Samaria. He went there, the apostle came. When it was time to preach to the Gentiles, until the Holy Ghost moved Peter, they didn't go anywhere. Even after the Holy Ghost has moved Peter, and there was a clear mandate on Barnabas and Paul, they didn't move anywhere. In fact, they organized a prayer meeting to seek the Lord. The Bible says when they were ministering to the Lord and the Holy Ghost spoke, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work which what I have given to them. That means they knew before, but they didn't move. They wanted to know the timing. And they were praying probably fasting. And said, Lord, what shall we do? What shall we do? Now that they said... They want to build schools all over the country. They want to build gigantic auditorium where uh, 500,000 people will be fellowship. Is it the Holy Ghost that is moving them? They will not move. Even Peter, Paul with his zeal, 
as he was evangelizing, 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 preaching the gospel, planting churches all over the place. At a point, the Bible says, the spirit of Christ, what did the priest of Christ say? Did forbid him to preach. He could not preach. He went to another time and said, ah, maybe, uh, okay, let us leave this world. Since the Holy Ghost will not let us preach here. He went to Ephesus. The Holy Ghost said, you are not preaching in Ephesus now. So he gave up until one night he dreamt. And somebody said, come and help us in Macedonia. And then he said, okay, the Holy Ghost has spoken. And they had to take sheep and go to another distant, far place to preach the gospel. And after he had finished preaching, he came back. All those places where the Holy Ghost said, don't preach. The Holy Ghost now said, preach. And he went to Ephesus and he stayed there for two years. And all the regions, thousands of people were converted because the Holy Ghost had spoken. It seems to me that in the early church, if the Holy Ghost will not move, they will not move. What do we see today? Human ambition. I want to plant churches in every five kilometers. Praise the Lord. We will stop there. We have almost we have finished the time. I'm sorry, I don't have you. <laughs> sorry, I wanted to obey the Holy Ghost. <laughs> so let us look at the question. Who introduced hierarchical structure to the church in Nigeria? Now, please, let me divide this question. Uh -huh. Next time, we will now go to the historical perspective on how hierarchy came to the church in general. Yeah, yes, the one in the afternoon. So let me divide this question. Can a young man, a young Christian, have gift of leadership and administration? Yes, he can have, but he needs to mature. Now, if that young man is in a good church, in a church that is well governed, the elders of that church will recognize his gift and they will groom him. They will groom him for leadership position. That's what they will do. But because we have a dysfunctional system now, that young man, they may even see him as a threat. We will talk about that later. And the young man will got, get frustrated and go and start his own church. And he has not been groomed. Praise the Lord. Now, who is the, ah, who is the source of a Nigerian popular pre preacher giving good evil? Ah, I can't, please, can somebody help me to read this? Number three. Please, next time, help me write it boldly. Yes, it is because human beings love darkness more than light. Now, you will see that many of the crowds who are, not, are not born again. When you interact with them, you know that they don't know Christ. And so they just want to have an appearance of religion without knowing Christ. So that's why you have the crowd. I've been to, I've been to all kinds of places. And most of the time, those people, most of them are not. It's just a few people. Yes, in every place, there will be a remnant. And there are people there. I can't say that there are no people who are born again in those churches. There are. But you will find that in some of those churches, the majority of them are not born again. They don't even know Christ. And when you see the way they behave, you will know. So that's why they have the crowd. But you know, those people want to pacify their conscience that at least they are going to church. And so that's what is happening. How, how can someone with mercy gifts be identified? Uh, you will know yourself because you give with ease. Okay, mercy. Okay. Okay. And the, the mercy they show, I still think in, is in place of taking care of people. Now, those who take care of people, you'll find that it comes to you naturally. If you see people, care for people, take care of them. You no. Know, when they are depressed, you encourage them, a compassionate. Uh -huh. Now, you'll find out that even in youthful fellowship, we tend to identify those people and we make them the visitation leader. <laughs> and yes, it means that even young people can identify those people. You see them, they tend to, they are the ones who most of the time will follow up young believers. They will encourage them. Sometimes we call them uh, disciples. Okay? 
Now, sometimes they are the ones who will bring up uh, somebody has fallen into sin. When everybody has chased the person away, they are, you are a sinner. They will go and meet him and say, yes, I know what you have done is wrong. And then they will bring that person up. They will nurture him again and then he will come back to Christ. So, these things will come naturally. When it is a gift, it's a gift. See, I teach naturally. But there are thousand and one people who teach naturally who cannot teach the scripture. It's a gift. You will just find out you are doing it. In fact, when I was a very young Christian, I'm still a young Christian now. When I was a very, very young Christian, I found that each time me and my brethren come together, it is always scripture we are sharing. And the time came, they started calling me the Daskalos. That was the name of my friend. If you see my classmates who are Christians in medical school, they would say the Daskalos. That, that's what they started calling me. The gift will manifest naturally if it is a gift. You don't force yourself because you are not the one who put it there. Now it is Christ who put it there. Praise the Lord. Yeah, now, Dickie is not a subset of elder. Dickies are people who assist the elder, especially in administering physical things. Although later, some of them could also have the ministry of the word. For example, we saw that Stephen actually had the ministry of the word. He was a mighty teacher, and he was refuting all the errors of the Jews to the extent that they even killed him. And we discovered that Philip is also a, a, an evangelist, and he was winning cities. The cities that even the apostles will not go. He went, to, he went to Samaria, he went to Gaza, he went to all those places that the apostles were not going. And he was winning them for Christ. Now, but initially, they are usually selected to help in the physical activities of the church. Maybe in organizing, in distributing things, you know. They are, they are the ones who usually do that. So they are not part of the elders. They are not. Now, deaconess, the Bible calls all of them deacon, diaconi. Now, he called them deacon. We saw that Paul talked about Phoebe, who was a servant of the church of Syncria. That word translated servant is actually deacon. So a woman can be a deacon. Now, usually, many a times, those women, they minister to the peculiar needs of women. They are supposed to have women who minister to the peculiar needs. You know, Women are not, we are not the same. All this uh, thing that men and women are the same is a lie. <laughs> we are not the same. Women have their peculiar name. And even Paul encouraged, he said, encourage the older women to teach the young women. So such women who are selected to do that, they are deacons. And so it's just that when something is for women, you say deaconess. And you put a nurse at the back. But it's the same thing. They are doing essentially the same thing. They are helping the elders. All right. Can an elder also has a gift of teaching, prophet, the, yes. the efficient yes. for... Yes, there are two ca categories of elders. There are elders who have the ministry of the world. Now, I can be a part, for now I'm not a part of body of elder of any church for a peculiar reason, but still we know the reason. But ordinarily I'm supposed to be. Yes. 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 Now, but you can... You can have the ministry gift and not be an elder. An elder means that you have been selected to govern a local church. That's what it just means. Now, there are elders who don't have the ministry of the world. That's why Paul said, the elders who have served where, deserve the world, especially those who minister the world. That means there are some elders who don't have the ministry of the world. Now, we don't call it, I don't like to call it ministry gift because all these services are not, they are all ministry gift. It's the ministry of the word and there are five of them. Okay? Yeah. Teachers, pastors, uh, evangelists, and Prophet. prophets, and apostles. They are the ones who have the ministry of the word. They preach the word. The unction of the spirit is on them. When they prepare and they stand in their office to minister, you will know that God is speaking through them. That's why some other people don't have that gift. When they come to minister, you see that the church will be quiet. And I used to say, in some places, because the body who govern the church, they have preference for some people. And they select those who, have the, who don't have the ministry of the world to preach. And you will see on the days when those people come to minister, the church will usually be cold. In fact, some people can bring out their phone and be pressing their phone. 
it is because the person who is preaching does not have the ministry of the word, but he can be an elder. Praise the Lord. Any other question? Okay. Hallelujah. All right. We have arranged uh, our questions, and even some of us who have not written our own, we have arranged that when it comes up, the next session is coming up again, uh, 3.30, 4 to 5.30. So it's still coming up 4 to 5.30. And so when it comes up that time, it would... Though he has a lot that the Lord has prepared him to tell us, that even if he's using the whole of... This is God's invitation to us. 